Well, welcome to another edition of the Hall Call interview series and podcast. I am Will Driscoll, the executive director here at the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame. And as always, I'm happy to bring you this content platform highlighting connections to sports in Virginia. Before we get started, I'd like to, as always, thank our sponsors you see over my shoulder. And we're really excited about the fall coming up here in Virginia because I think the general gist of what I'm understanding is Virginia is for golf lovers. Over a seven-week period, three high-level events will call the Commonwealth home with the Solheim Cup, the U.S. Mid-Amateur Championship, and the Dominion Energy Charity Classic. Today, Hall Call is going to focus on the, the second of those three events, the 43rd U.S. Mid-Amateur Championship, also known as the Mid-Am, which will be held September 21st through the 26th at Kinlock Golf Club with Independence Golf Club providing support to host 264 of the world's best amateur golfers. To help us paint the picture of what to expect, we are joined today by Vinny Giles, a 1976 Virginia Sports Hall of Fame inductee and architect of Kinlock Golf Club, general manager of Kinlock Golf Club, Eric Rule, and general chairman of the Mid-Am, Mike Crowley. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking some time to join us today. Thank you. Well, first of all, let, let's go ahead and get this started. We'll tee it off, if you will, pun intended. Um, for those who don't know, this event, the U.S. Mid-Am, the 43rd U.S. Mid-Am, was actually scheduled to take place at Kinlock in 2020, but due to a global pandemic, it was canceled and ultimately rescheduled. How, Vinny, I'll start with you. How excited are you to finally be at the point where we are now a month away from teeing off the Mid-Am in Virginia? Well, we are obviously uh, ecstatic to have a, a, a second USGA event here. We had the U.S. Senior Amateur here in 2011, and that was a highly successful, a great champion. And we uh, we were looking forward to bringing in 264 of the, of the uh, top U.S. Ben Ams and uh, a few foreigners, actually, uh, for the event. Kenlock is, you know, is a USGA oriented club. Uh, we've got a good relationship there, obviously, because they've considered us for these two events. And we are hoping that uh, in the future, maybe we'll be able to host a couple more of the USGA championships as time goes on. As I mentioned earlier, uh, our only uh, issue right now is Mother Nature. We've got the golf course in really good shape. Uh, especially when you're talking about mid late August, and all we need to do now is cut grass, and uh, and we've got a great week coming up weather-wise, which is going to help us. We shut down on uh, September one uh, all the way through the championship to get ready for it. So if we have no hurricanes, no tornadoes, and uh, no rain, we're going to be in really good shape. Well, we're knocking on wood. We're crossing our fingers. We're doing all of that because we want to make sure this event gets gets off and gets off without a hitch. Uh, Eric, I'll come to you as the general manager of a club like Kinlock. How excited are you to bring some of the world's best golfers to this great track that you have in Central Virginia? Uh, it's it's going to be a real honor for us to have 264 of the best golfers that aren't playing on tour right now here at Kinlock. I've been around championship golf all my life, and my favorite event was the U.S. Amateur that I was the GM at at Oak Hill. This is just like that. It's so much fun to walk in the fairway with the players side by side, watch them hit the ball, and hopefully we'll have a couple thousand people out here to be able to watch them and, and be a part of Kinlock, which they don't normally get a chance to be out here. So it's, it's fun to open our doors to everybody in the Richmond area, not only the players. Now, and, and it's uh, it, it's great to plant that flag here in Virginia. This is actually the second time that the Mid-Am has been hosted at a course in Virginia. The first was 2000 uh, at the Cascades course at the Homestead. So second time in 43 years. This is nothing to, to scoff at. Mike, I'll come to you kind of on that same note. What goes into starting the process of getting a tournament like this to come to a course like Kinlock? Well, there, there's obviously a lot involved, and, and, and let me start off by saying that uh, the team here at Kenlock uh, is exceptional, and Eric's experience in doing something like this, and the rest of the team have really rolled up their sleeves and, and gotten involved in this. And you know, one of the things we have to do uh, is is arrange 
uh, financial support to put on an event like this in the way that we want to that represents Virginia and Richmond and Kemah Golf Club. And I have to say that the business community and a number of our members uh, that we approach to help us with this uh, all without question and without hesitation stepped up to support this event. You know, I think the other thing to, to put it on, once we once we got through that hurdle, um, Eric and, and myself and Andrew Black, our head pro, and Paul Howell, our food and beverage manager, went to Aaron Hills two years ago to monitor the event there at, at Aaron Hills in Blue Mound was the sister course. And they did an exceptional job other than seven inches of rain on Sunday, which set the tournament back. And then last year, we went, same group, went up to Sleepy Hollow uh, outside New York City, uh, and Fenway was the sister course. And Sleepy Hollow, again, put on a fabulous event. So we got two really good looks at what it takes uh, to put on an event like this, and two, what the bar was for us to shine here at Kenlock in comparison to other clubs. And the bar is very hot, uh, but I feel very confident that uh, that we're ready, that the team is well prepared and, and excited about it. And our response uh, with help from the Virginia State Golf Association, uh, we need about 350 volunteers. Uh, we opened that to members on, I think, April 1, uh, the website. We opened it to the public on May 1st, and the response was exceptional. We have the volunteers we needed. It was overwhelming. Um, Laura Zider, who is working with us at One Up Sports, who's run a number of these events for the USGA and the Tour, uh, is helping lead with Eric uh, what needs to happen, particularly in the volunteer world. So we're ready to go. There's a lot involved a lot of detail, um, and uh, we had a meeting uh, just a week or so ago with all the committee chairmen going through every single detail, and uh, I couldn't feel better about where we are. Well, the, the, USJ, the USGA, the United States Golf Association, does not set very low bars. They set very high bars, so it, I think that's important. And for, for people who are going to either watch this video or listen to it in podcast form, go back and, and see some of the courses that this event has been hosted at. These are some of the nationally and internationally recognized courses, and so I think that's something that brings even more excitement to it. Uh, Vinny, I'll, I'll come back to you just to kind of talk about the the amateur aspect of this event uh we know the pga tour we we know the champions tour but for those who might only be focused on those events that happen every weekend on the pga and champions tour what makes an event like the mid-am so special well i think that what you find will is a lot of players who are 25 and over have either played golf in college or actually try to play on some part of the PGA Tour, whether it's the Corn Ferry Tour, the PGA Tour of Americas, and they decided at age probably more than 25, probably closer to 28 or 29, that it was probably time to get a real job because <laughs> they weren't cutting it uh, playing, trying to play professionally. Uh, but they want to keep their hand in. Uh, I think you might have seen that uh, this past week at Hazeltine, the medalist in the U.S. Amateur who shot nine under par the second round was 39 years old. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's unheard of because the U.S. Amateur is a, what I now call a junior tournament. I mean, the two finalists were both in college. I think mean, neither one of them were more than 20 or 21 years old. Um, this gives that group, that group being the mid-ams, a chance to continue to compete at a high level uh, while they work, uh, while they in a lot of times transition into work. Uh, and it gives us at Kenlock and other clubs like us, like Mike, Mike mentioned, uh, Aaron Hills, Sleepy Hollow, a chance to host not only some of the best uh, ever players in, in the world, but more importantly, to let the public and the membership and hopefully a little bit of help from Golf Channel, et cetera, 
uh, see that these guys are still pretty doggone good. Mm -hmm. And uh, they want to compete. They just can't compete at the, quote, highest level. Yeah, when, when you're talking about these guys are pretty good, the the if correct me if I'm wrong, but to be to compete in the mid am, which is different from the US amateur, it, you have to be 25 and over. And again, getting back to these guys are pretty good, your handicap has to be 2.4 or less. Is that correct? I think that's correct. I mean, you know, handicaps are handicaps, you can them any way you want to, as you well know. They're the guys that like to gamble, they want theirs up. They're the guys that want to compete, they want theirs down. So right. you can manipulate a handicap, but yes, it does tell you that for all intents and purposes, they're supposed to be pretty doggone good players. So Eric, I'll I'll come to you with the next question. Obviously, 264 players, that is a big, big field. And you mentioned that you all like some of your predecessors, have a sister course that you're working with, and that is Independence Golf Club uh, in Midlothian, I believe. Uh, talk about the relationship between Kinlock and Independence and how this was a match made in heaven for this particular event. Well, we uh, when this contract was signed, there was a board member that owns Independence on our board. And, uh, you know, the relationship grew from that. But, you know, it's been such a really good opportunity to work with them. Um, you know, Gift Breed has done a great job of coordinating what has to happen in Independence with the USGA and with Kinlock. And, uh, you know, the first four days of the event are the busiest. We have 132 golfers here one day. He has 132 golfers there. They switch, then they switch again, then they switch back. So... There's a lot of moving around, a lot of parts, and everything that we do here, as far as evacuation and food service and, and gallery control and all that kind of stuff, they have to do over there. They just have to do it for four days less than we do. So the relationship's been great. He's got a lot of really good people over there. Um, they've helped point me. I'm relatively new to the Richmond market. They've helped me point me in the right direction a couple of times, and I, I'm ecstatic about having a club like that to be able to work with us. Mike, uh, coming coming to you on, with this next one, uh, when you look at the amount of golf that needs to be played over the five day, over the six days, I believe, what are some of the logistical challenges that go into making sure that that goes off without any conflict or any issue? Well, I, uh, well, it starts with the volunteers and volunteer training. And as we said, you know, we're looking at about 350 volunteers. And uh, we have volunteer training on August 28th and 29th uh, to prepare these people. We have great committee chairman uh, who will be here on site, uh, whether it's medical or whether it's volunteer or, or whether it's Browns, uh, to make sure that people are where they're supposed to be and doing what they need to do. But, you know, it even gets down, Will, to, you know, stocking the tea box with water and snacks and to eliminating trash on a regular basis. Uh, you know, Eric mentioned evacuation. And, you know, one of the challenges that we didn't expect, uh, we need about 22, 50, 12 to 15 passenger vans to be staged here in an independence so that if we do have to evacuate, there were seven evacuations at Sleepy Hollow last year were prepared. So training the drivers, telling them where they need to be. But we found uh, in the middle of all this, we couldn't get the vans. They weren't available. And so that became a big, big challenge. And Eric, through just dogging this, continued to push and push. And we were finally able to get the vans that we need. And the vans are important. We would have had to use show carts otherwise, but the vans are important because if there's a temporary delay because of lightning in the area and it's going to be short, where well, you can house the players in the vans on site and then get them back on the golf course a lot quicker. If we had show carts, we'd have to bring everybody back in and then get everybody organized and back out. So there's an enormous amount of detail. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we've gone through it. Uh, I feel like we've crossed the T's and dotted the I's and that people are prepared. Vinny, I, I want to come to you for this next one. Uh, we obviously talked about the difference between a, a pro and an amateur, but that competitive spirit, I don't know if there's that much 
difference between the tour and and the uh, an event like the mid am as a as a an individual who played in a lot of events like this talk about the competitive nature of an amateur golfer that wants to still compete while they also have the you know their regular day job well i think that one thing as, as i'm sure you know the winner of the mid am traditionally has, has got an invitation to the master mm -hmm. So there, in and of itself, gives you all the, the motivation you want. Uh, all of these guys have played at a high level, whether it's a tour event, uh, a, a mini tour event, et cetera. They didn't, and most of them probably went to college on some sort of golf scholarship. So they have played a lot of high level golf they haven't lost their desire. In some cases, maybe they lost a little of their talent. But when they show up here, I mean, 264 players for 64 spots. So you better bring at least your A minus game just to get the match play. Um, I don't think you find any lack of competitiveness in, I'll say, two thirds of the field, to be fair. Some of them are just happy to be here. It's their first year SGA championship. Quite honestly, the whole scenario is a little overwhelming to them. But when you get to the 64, there's not a guy in that group that isn't trying to put their, their uh, foot on somebody's throat as quickly as they can get the foot on the throat. So <laughs> they're plenty competitive. Don't worry. I think you need to be because if I if I did the math correct, the winner will play the equivalent of nine rounds of golf over a six day period, which is a lot of golf. <laughs> it's a lot right. of golf. I, mean, I, I recall back when I was fortunate enough to get to the finals of the U.S. Senior, and that's over fifty five, and I played eleven rounds of golf in nine days, and uh, needless to say. I didn't think I could play 11 rounds of golf in nine days. Well, I, I want to talk about the course. And, you know, uh, courses, golf courses have a way of, of helping somebody win or determining who loses. Where is this tournament going to be won? Speaking specifically about the course, what holes should we be looking at? And Eric, you're the GM. I'll come to you with this. Where is this tournament going to be won or lost at Kinlock? Well, an interesting thing is we've reversed the nines to get the finishing hole if it ever gets that far closer to the clubhouse. Yeah. It brings the whole back nine closer to the clubhouse, which is one of the things that makes it a lot of fun. I mean, if you walk out in the afternoon and you want to go watch these guys play, you can go out and catch them and have the shortest walk without having to go across our dam on the golf course. So, you know, they're starting on 10 and they're playing the back nine first and they're coming to the front. And I think the you know, the last four holes are probably the holes that are going to be interesting to watch, uh, maybe the last five holes. Um, and we all get confused because now we've got to call number one, number 10 and trying to think through all those. But I think uh, 15, 16, 17, 18 are going to be real challenging holes or not a long walk from the clubhouse so people can walk out there and watch that happen. Most of the whole, most of the matches don't go 18 holes. So, you know, they're going to be settled on maybe 14, 15, 16, 17. That's going to be a, a great place to watch golf. There's not a lot of walking involved to get out there and watch. And for those spectators that are going to come that have trouble moving, we have mobility scooters here that they'll be able to get out um, and, and watch an awful lot of golf. They just have to stay in our cart paths. So, Mike, as you're going through the process of pitching this idea to the USGA, so that, that Kinlock is the right is the right venue for an event like this, for the golf junkies out there, what are some other courses that have that national or international recognition that you would maybe compare Kinlock to? Well, I think there, I think there are a lot of. First of all, uh, you know. We, did, we didn't get this in 2020 because of COVID. We had to shut it down. So the USGA was great in, in slotting us back that soon after 2020 closed. So Vinny and the team, long before I got involved with this, were the ones that pitched for the senior am and, and pitched for the mid am. And then that followed through, obviously, to the, the redo of this event. But when you look at Kenlock, uh, there are a number of 
of wonderful clubs around. I mean, the, it, in terms of, you know, it, it just use Sleepy Hollow last year uh, and Penway, but Sleepy Hollow in particular, you know, fabulous Seth Rayner golf course, wonderful clubhouse, wonderful facility overlooking the Hudson River. We obviously don't have the Hudson River, but we have a gorgeous golf course and, you know, so it'd be hard to pick whether it's whether it's the honors course outside of Chattanooga or whether it's a place like Sleepy Hollow or some of the great northeastern courses uh, like National Golf Links or wherever a lot of these have been. Um, there's so many good golf courses. I think the difference here is that we have a smaller membership and we have a membership that truly was excited in 2020, but is really excited now that we got slotted back. And that's just proven by the way they stepped up to support uh, this event. And, and the event is the event's not only good for Killock, but it's very good for the community. It's very good, uh, you know, for the hotels and the restaurants, uh, you know. So I think Richmond, if you look back, Richmond has a wonderful golf community. And you, you look at the crowds at the Dominion Energy Classic, which are some of the largest the senior tour gets all year long. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we will have, we won't have that kind of crowd, but we'll have a larger crowd maybe than they had at Sleepy Hollow or maybe than they had it at Aaron Hills because of the Richmond golf community and how they support it. And again, that was proven by the sign up for the volunteers, which just filled up very quickly. Well, you, you answered my next question about the, the meaning of an event like this in the Richmond region. And Eric, I'll come back to you for this question. I mentioned in the intro that in a seven week period, Virginia has the Solheim Cup. We have the Mid-Am and we have the Dominion Energy Charity Classic. You know, for a state that doesn't have NFL, Major League Baseball, NBA in within our borders, it's important to have events like this um, so how excited are you and how excited should just not to golf, the golf community, but the general sports community feel about having three events like that in such a short time frame that they can get to within a day's drive if they don't live in the region? Well, I think it's spectacular for Virginia. Um, you know, I know if we want to go to any professional sports games, we've got to drive two hours and battle with 95 to get up to the D.C. area to do that. But here, people can come over here. They can walk in the golf course. Um, you know, this is the eighth major championship that I've been associated with, and it is a great opportunity. There were over 6,400 people that tried to qualify for this event to get down to 264. And, you know, our community is, is going to be blessed with some of the best golfers that have even played in the state. And, Having been involved with an event like the Ryder Cup, it's very similar to Solheim Cup. Mm -hmm. Golf is a really, really exciting sport to be able to come out, walk around, get some fresh air, and enjoy yourself outside. So it's it's great for the community. And you know, it's a smaller event, but it's certainly in in scale of uh, national championships, it's one of the bigger ones that we can have here based on our infrastructure. Well, I'll go ahead and uh, I'll get you guys out of here on this, but Vinny, I'll go ahead and start with you. As a Virginia Sports Hall of Fame inductee, you, you've been ingrained in the golf tradition here in Virginia. How much pride are you taking in knowing that this event is going to be in Virginia and hopefully we can maybe get it back in the future? Well, I think, Will, the, the, the most pride I have, quite honestly, is showing off how wonderful facility it can off. Um, I don't think you asked the question about the golf course. I think it's one of the best match play golf courses you'll ever see. There are all kinds of variables and risk rewards, et cetera. Um, I think that, I think they will shoot some very good scores at Kenlock because our fairways are generous and our greens are perfect. Um, but the pride is just in further exposing Kenlock to these 264 great players and knowing that of the 264, an awful lot of them are going to take back with them what a wonderful place Kenlock is, what a great facility it is. And I promise you, 
They'll come back saying, I've never felt Southern hospitality any more totally than I felt at Kenlock Golf Club. That's really where the pride to me is, is showing off Kenlock. Mike, I'll let you get the last word. Now that we're just over a month away from this, what is exciting you the most about this process finally coming to fruition? Well, I, you know, with the amount of hours that the team has put in here, uh, including travel to, to two other events, uh, the enthusiasm uh, that they have for the event, you know, I take a lot of pride in, in uh, just being able to work with them and be a part of this. And I, I think when it's all said and done, as Vinny said, uh, I believe that people will leave here saying, wow, you know, they set the bar pretty high for the next event, which is a trim next year. So we're excited about it. Well, we, we are excited about it as well. And our fingers are crossed. Again, we're going to touch rabbit feet. We're going to knock on wood. Hopefully the weather holds out. Uh, we're a month away, but I know you guys have a lot to do in that month. So I do appreciate you taking some time to join us today on Hall Call in what I know is a busy schedule. So thank you so much, gentlemen. Thanks, Will. Well, thanks, thanks a lot. Nice being with you. Absolutely. Well, thank you. And for those who are watching and following along and will listen, the U.S. Mid-Am takes place September 21st through the 26th at Kinlock Golf Club with Independence Golf Club providing support. Both of those are just outside of Richmond. For more information, you can visit www.kinlockgolfclub.com. I'd like to thank everyone who's going to watch or listen in podcast form. Of course, thank you, thank you to our sponsors you see over my shoulder. Be sure to stay up to date on all things Virginia Sports Hall of Fame by following us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. You can also listen to the Hall Call podcast on Apple, Spotify, or SoundCloud. Once again, I'm Will Driscoll with the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame. Whatever you do, participate, don't spectate, and we'll see you next time.